Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you Can for you being first, here. The first one, um, yeah. On behalf of the Centro family, my name is Evie Tegaso. I'm the event one. coordinator at Centro. And we're surrounded by many folks from our staff that work here on 68 and also from the side. library. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight at our first spring event. And particularly honored to present a panel on the subject of Pura Belpre White one of our beloved and generous donors to our central archives. Uh, if you ever have the opportunity, please stop by the library. We have a fabulous collection, not only of Pura Belpre, but other uh, high profile um, individuals from the Puerto Rican community. And you'll be amazed at the wonderful and in-depth collection that is there located at the library. So take the opportunity to stop by, uh, tell your friends, your families, students, uh, young children that you know. It's a worthwhile experience and you know uh, it's good to make the trip and also for you uh, if you have the time to do that during the week. Um, during her professional career, Ms. Belbre sought to empower children of all nations by going back to their roots and folklore. She was a children's librarian and author who researched world cultures to extract the values and qualities that children could identify with. And at this point, I am going to turn the floor over to uh, our presenters this evening, Dr. Manuel Moran, uh, Artistic Director of SEA, which is located in the Lower East Side and housed in the Clemente Soto Velez Cultural Center in the Lower East Side, 107 Suffolk Street. Marisa Jimenez <laughs> Garcia, Dale. a researcher here at Centro and Floyd Bromley, which we are honored to have her. Uh, she is going to take on the persona of Buddha and do a little story, t two actually, two storytelling stories. So I'm going to turn the floor over to um, Manuel and you know, again, welcome. And you're in store for a really very lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, buenas tardes. Buen Thank you so much for inviting me and inviting uh, Teatro SEA. Uh, we're the Society of the Educational Arts, uh, the only Latino children's theater in the nation, actually. And we're located in the, uh, the, lo in, in the Lower East Side at the Clemente Soto Vélez Cultural Center. Um, before I talk a little bit about the work we do, we're going to do a little presentation of a project that we call the Pura del Pre Project, and it's a project that we're doing uh, in the libraries and also in classrooms and in uh, different settings. And we have our wonderful actress, Flora Brumley, and she's going to be uh, doing a little part of the Pura del Pre Project that we do with the kids. So I want everyone to become a kid now. Okay, and bear with us, have fun, and enjoy the Pura del Pre Project. All right. Hello. Hello. Hola. Hola. My name is Flor. Can you say hola, Flor? Hola, Flor. But my friends, why are you so far back? There's space over here so you can come and sit down to enjoy the puppet show. Because today we're going to have a show. I come from a company called Teatro Sea. And as my Manuel was saying, it's the only Latino children's company in the nation. Can you believe it? In Teatro Sea, we bring stories to life. And, and we've been bilingual stories because I am bilingual. I speak Spanish and I speak English. Who here speaks Spanish? Raise your hand. Who here speaks English? Raise your hand. <laughs> Who here is bilingual? <laughs> All right. I'm bilingual because I come from Peru. And Peru is a lovely town down in South America. And here I am presenting a show for you. Well, in Teatro Sea we bring stories to life with the use of puppets and music. Who likes puppets? Who likes music? <laughs> <laughs> All right, and today I'm here to present you a story about Pura del Pre. You say, who? Who? Who, who is this lady you're talking about? Can you say Pura? 
Pura. Can you say bel pre? Bel pre. Now put it all together and say pura bel pre. Pura bel pre. Oh well, are you ready for me to tell you her story? Yes. I, I don't believe you. Are you ready for me to tell you her story? Yes. yes. Alright, so here we go. Once upon a time, in the lovely island of Puerto Rico in the Caribbean, a little baby girl was born. They named her Pura. And she was beautiful. That little lovely girl grew up and became a lovely young girl. And her favorite thing to do was to sit in the kitchen, hearing to her abuelita's stories while she was making arroz con habichuelas. Oh, she told her so many stories about a little cockroach named Martina and about a little boy named Juan Bobo. She always remembered those stories. Well, little young Pura grew up and became a lovely young lady who graduated high school in Puerto Rico. Dun, da, dun, dun, dun. Thank you. <laughs> so, after graduation, she decided to continue her studies in the University of Puerto Rico. Oh, she loved to study and she loved to read. But when she wasn't in the university, her sister Elisa was getting married. Tan, tan, ta, tan, 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 ta, tan. But not in Puerto Rico, in New York City. So, Pura and her whole family decided to come from Puerto Rico to Nueva York for the wedding. And when they arrived to Nueva York, ta, 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 ra, 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 ta, ta, ra, ra. Pura was dazzled with the lights and the architecture and the amazing culture. And she decided that she was going to stay. I'm going to stay. Well, she needed a job. So, she knew how to make dresses. She got a job in the garment industry making dresses. <clears throat> but she also loved to read. And one day when she went to the big library in Nueva York, she decided that, why not? She wanted to become a librarian. And she studied and she became the first Puerto Rican librarian. Que honor! But one day, while she was in her library looking at some books, she realized that there were not books in, in Spanish for her to read to the young Spanish children that would come to her. And she said, no, 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 no. So she decided that she was going to write some of the stories she remembered about little Cucarachita Martina and little Juan Bom. Well, she became a published author. And then she started to tell her stories in the libraries in front of so many beautiful children that were dazzled by her stories. And she also loved puppets. In fact, she loved three things the most. Children, puppets, and books. But what am I telling you all this? You know what? She's coming, believe it or not, she's coming here today. She's coming here to tell you some of her stories. So we're going to call her out with a little chant. Mm -hmm. Repeat after me. Pura bel pre. Pura bel pre. Pura bel pre. Pura bel pre. Lover of children, puppets, and tails. Lover of children, puppets, and tails. I can hear you. Pura bel pre. Pura bel pre. Pura bel pre. Pura bel pre. Lover of children, puppets, and tails. Lover of children, puppets, and tails. Bring us your magic. Bring us your magic. Bring us your magic. Bring us your magic. And tell us your stories today. And tell us your stories today. Oh, hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. I am so happy to be in this place to tell you some of my stories. Oh, as you know, I love to tell stories and puppets. That, that's an old picture of me. <laughs> we can put it away. <laughs> All right, because here I have some beautiful stories and puppets to share with you. So are you ready for me to tell you the first story? Yes. All right, this is called Perez and Martina by me. Pura del Pre. Many years ago, in a little round balcony, there lived a special
Spanish cockroach named Martina. <laughs> Martina was a beautiful cockroach with big black eyes and soft brown skin. And Martina was very proud of her descent. She was a very good housekeeper. And one day, while she was sweeping the floors, sweep, sweep, sweep of her patio, sweep, 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 she found a peseta. Cookies. Cookies? Oh no, no, I have only eight many cookies. What? Candy. Candy. Oh, I, I, you're bad. <laughs> no, I already ate candy. I, dress? Well, maybe I have so many dresses. Oh, I know. I'm gonna buy a box of powder. Some makeup. Maquillaje. And that's what she did. She put some makeup on her beautiful face. And she sat in her balcony. <sighs> she said, Well, she loved Raton Perez, but she hadn't told him yet. Mm -hmm. Well, Martina was wondering if Perez was going to show up. A lovely little character came. It wasn't Perez. It was a cat. Señor Gato. Meow! Meow! Oh, Martina! She looks so lovely today. Oh, Martina! Señorita Martina! Listen, I, I've been meaning to ask you something. Would you marry me? Oh, that's so unexpected. I am. Uh, uh, let me see. How would you talk to me in the future? I would talk to you like this. Meow! 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 Oh, uh, that's a little, um, not so pleasant. <laughs> uh, thank you, but I'm sorry. I, I can't marry you. No, thank you. Oh, okay. I'll go then. Señor Gato left with tears in his eyes. <laughs> Don't worry, he's gonna be okay. <laughs> the next character to arrive was a very proud and loud rooster, Señor Gallo. Destroyed. The next character to show up was a very shy but very, very interesting duck, El Señor Pato. Quack, quack. Quack, quack. Señorita Martina. Señorita Martina. Would you marry me? Oh, hi, Señor Pato. Wow. Uh, three proposals in a day. I don't know. Uh, uh, how will you talk to me in the future? I will talk to you like this. <coughs> quack, quack. <laughs> quack, quack. Quack. Oh, that's a little boring. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, but no, 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 thank you. It's okay. Quack, quack. Quack, quack. I'm so sad. Quack, quack. <laughs> <laughs> he had a lot of emotions to express. Well, then, next to Señorita Martina's house. In a little pond, there lived a cricket and a frog. And they were friends. Yeah. But they were also rivals. They both saw Martina and said, I'm going to ask her to marry me. No, I'm going to ask her to marry me. No, I'm going to ask her to marry me. I'm going to go first. No, I'm going to go. 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 Why are you talking to her? I'm going to go. 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 Hey! Please leave me alone. You guys are fighting and I don't like it. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh no. She doesn't want me. No, I don't know. But we can still 
gonna be friends yet. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> oh, where was Fettus? Martina was asking. Well, Fettus soon arrived. He was back singing a wonderful song. De España un ratoncito soy, en una cueva vivo, por las tardes veo la puesta del sol, a veces veo al rey y a la reina pasar, I am a little mouse from sunny Spain, in royal mansion halls is my domain, sometimes I watch the sunset and sometimes I see the king and the queen go by. Thank you, thank you. Um, hello, señorita Martina. Ah, oh, oh, hello, señor Pérez. How are you today? I've been meaning to ask you a very important question. Yes? Would you, would you marry me? Ah, ah, well, I have to be fair. I have to, before I say anything, I have to ask you, how will you talk to me in the future? I will talk to you in the language of my forefathers, like this. That sounds like music! Yes! Yes, I'll marry you! Yay! And they were married. But our story does not end there. Ah, oh, no, 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 like a good Spanish story has a second part. <laughs> On Christmas time, Martina decided to make a special dish for Pérez. So, she was going to cook something really good. Arroz con leche! So, she put some rice in it, and she put some milk in it, and she put some almonds in it, clavo de olor, some sugar, and, and she let it boil. <sighs> I'm going to go clean my patio. Oh, oh, well, Perez came home, and Perez loved the arroz con leche. It smells delicious. Oh, my lovely Martina made my favorite dish. Oh, oh, is that an, is that an almond there? Oh, I love almonds, and I'm so hungry. Maybe if I can just grab it. I don't think anything's going to happen to me, right? No, no, no nothing's nothing. going to happen to me if I just no. grab it. I, oh, it's a little hot. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just going to... It looks so good. I'm just, if I, oh, it's a little hot. <laughs> I, I almost get it. I almost have it. And, 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 oh, oh! <laughs> <laughs> Perez fell in the pot. <laughs> and... He wasn't doing so well. <laughs> Martina came back home. Hey, I'm going to see how my arroz! Oh, no! Perez! What are you doing? Come back to me, Perez! I would put their whole body into a boiling pot! <laughs> so, Martina... Put on a lovely mantilla on her lovely, beautiful head. Took off a fan. Took out her guitar and started singing a song. El ratoncito perecer cayó en la olla y la cucarachita Martina lo canta y lo llora. 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 She weeps and she cries. And to this day, she still waits for her friend, her lost, long love, to come back to her. Y colorín colorado, este cuento se ha terminado. Gracias. Very good. Thank you so much, Pura, for visiting us um, for, uh, um, and for everybody here. Uh, this is part. Of, it's hard to perform for adults, huh? Yeah. When, <laughs> when you're doing a kids show. But she's doing great. She did great. She's gonna do another story later on. Um, but I, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the, the work we do and and why we have decided to do this project called the Pura del Pre. Mm, 
many of you might know, um, the Teatro Sea is a, is a, is a Latino children's company. Uh, we've been in existence since 1985. Uh, I started the company in Puerto Rico. Um, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, and my hometown is Vega Baja uh, in the north of Puerto Rico. And uh, actually, I always start telling people about SEA, but I have to tell and share my story because I, in certain ways, basically what Pura was doing, she was actually touching uh, many kids' lives when she was going to libraries and reading books and using puppets to talk uh, and to share the stories from, from be her beloved uh, Puerto Rico. In my case, the first time that I saw theater was when I was in third grade, back in my uh, elementary school in Puerto Rico, uh, in Vega Baja, the Jose Gualberto Padilla School. Uh, it was, I was in third grade, there was a theater company that was called La Compañía Teatral de Maestros, the teacher's theater company, the government had monies uh, to create a, teach, a theater companies with teachers. And they would put um, a place and they would go to the island schools, to every, every day they, had one, they visit, visited one or two schools and they would put uh, performances for the, for the students. It was the first time I saw I ever saw a production. It was called La Plenopera del Empache, the Belly Ache Opera, which is a play that now I do for schools. We do it in, you know, in schools not only in Puerto Rico, but also here in the United States. After the performance, you know, the performance was full of music. They had live music, actors, singers, they had puppets, beautiful sets, costumes. I was mesmerized. I said, Mom, that's what I want to do, eh, cuando sea grande. And that's exactly what I, what I became. I became an actor, I became, I not only became an actor, I decided that I wanted to do children's theater and, and perform at schools like this company eh, of teachers have done in, in my school. Then we created an organization, eh, it was a community group at that in my hometown, and very soon, in a few years, we became one of the leading children's theater companies in the island. Then um, we were not only performing in, in San Juan, but we were also uh, performing uh, in you know throughout the, the throughout the throughout the island, especially in in towns like Orocovis and and Ciales, you know where, where usually many kids do not are not exposed to theater. We would go there and do performances with puppets, with music, uh, put up uh, shows. Then I decided to come to the states uh, in 1991. I can't believe it's been that long uh, to go to school to continue my studies at NYU in a program that they had that they have it's called an educational theater program and combine that with musical theater and I decided to start researching and finding out about the community mis hermanos de acá uh, I really didn't know too much I have family I have relatives here but and I have visited New York prior to moving to New York but um, it was a new experience for me. I wasn't really familiarized with the diaspora. Uh, unfortunately, that's still you know a, a huge gap that we're trying to 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 work. And I know Centro is part of the mission of Centro to try to to close that gap between you know Puerto Ricans in, in the island and Puerto Ricans in the diaspora in, in the United States. So um, I decided to all my research work in the university was related to my community and my people here. Um, I realized and I found out that we didn't have, in the make of the theater of the world, with so many Puerto Ricans and Latinos, there was no children's, Latino children's theater. And I was surprised because that's actually something that in Latin America and in Puerto Rico, it was part of the integral um, a, a development of children in school is part of the curriculum, you know. And there was there were many different groups, but and mm, Teatro Pregones, Rodante, eh, eh, Repertorio Español, and some other groups. Eh, Don Quixote. There was a, a group called Don Quixote Children's Theater, uh, but they would do sporadic uh, performances for for children. They were mostly performed for youth and and uh, uh, high school students and young adults, but not nobody really was working with the with the little ones. Uh, um, uh, like consistently, that's what I'm because there were many different programs, I would say, but it wasn't really somebody specifically targeting that group all the time. And I saw a huge need and I saw an opportunity as well to bring what I was doing with so much success in Puerto Rico to New York. And that's how SEA started in New York. In 1993, we, we became an organization here, and in 1995, we started performing at the schools. 
Uh, we put together some of the shows that we had brought from Puerto Rico here. We created new shows. And then after a performance, and I'm telling you all this because it's important, that's how I came across Pura. Um, after a performance uh, in a school in El Barrio, one teacher comes, comes to me and she said, Ah, you're like the new Pura del Prebo with theater. She's, and I went like, um, what? And I said, yes, you're like the new Pura del Prebo, but you're now doing it with theater. And I didn't know who Pura del Pre was, unfortunately. And, they, and she started telling me, you don't know who Pura, who Pura del Pre was? And she started telling me, the first Puerto Rican librarian, the first Puerto Rican, and actually the first person who published uh, bilingual children's books in the United States in the late 20s. And you know, she told me her story, and I was mesmerized, and I'm very impressed with her story. And I decided to start finding out about this amazing Puerto Rican woman who had a pioneer, literally, uh, who had done amazing uh, things. And that's how I became and how Sea became really involved with Pura del Pre. We decided to take some of her stories and uh, and, and put them on, on the main stage. Um, we have we have done three performances. And other than this, uh, we have three main stage productions, which I think if you can continue. Well, that's part of the, what we're doing in the libraries, um, and which is this. Li we're, this is basically we're recreating what she used to do. Pura del Pre until her last days, she will take a luggage like that full of puppets and books and she will visit different libraries. And that's basically what we're doing uh, with this uh, with this production. It's a small setting production, it's only like for 25 to 30 kids. But you know, I, they learn a little bit about uh, her life and also about her s different stories. We also, in SEA, decided that we wanted to do um, a, a homage to her, a, a, like a, an homenaje a Pura. And we put together, we have a, a festival called Body Me. Uh, which is a, a festival that we do every year. This is going to be our 10th uh, year doing the festival, and we have been collaborating with Centro since we started uh, 10 years ago. Um, and we decide that we're going to dedicate, we do this during Puerto Rican Heritage Month, which is November. We do close to 30 events throughout the city, and we have roundtable discussions, we have uh, f a film series, we have theater, we have music, we have many different things that we do, and we always dedicate uh, the, the festival to a historical figure, um, and that year it was like four years ago. We decided, four yeah, four years ago we decided to dedicate the festival body mix to Pura del Pre, and that during that whole month we had exhibitions. That we, actually we had an exhibition uh, with Centro. We also had artists, uh, uh, visual artists, do some work um, based on her stories and her you know illustrate her books in a, in a different way, in a, in a in a in a more contemporary way. We have roundtable discussions, we had concerts, we had readings, we had performances, and it was a wonderful beginning uh, for our project to start visiting many communities and saying, you know what, her legacy is still alive, it is amazing, this woman is amazing, look at the things that she's doing, and we decided to bring it to, to the to, to the festival. Uh, the other thing that we do, and I'm going to be very fast, is, yeah, you can, uh, this is actually, um, we have a, we have an actress actually a perform not only Flor but we have that's Johanna Rodriguez and you know we have a production called La Cucarachita Martina which is one of her stories based on her book Perez and Martina and uh, we always have in special occasions. Pura introduced the show to the kids, and we tried to recreate, you know, the same uh, costume. Um, we created Jose created the, the puppets uh, based on that famous photo. So we brought some of the hand puppets in a very simple way that you know that she she did it. Uh, they're a little bigger than what usually you know the, the puppets that she had. Let me put one on. It's just with the mic. Yeah. Oh, can you hold them? Perfect, because. And take your hat off, and you look like her. Very good. It's a good photo opportunity uh, uh, with Pura, and and so the kids not only see the real Pura, you know, because we have the picture of her, but we talk a little bit about her her story, and you know, and they can see the puppets um, that that she she created, and and I know that many many teachers become interest, interested in her in, in Pura, and then they they start researching and talking to the kids about her. This is one of the things that we do to preserve. Um, her legacy and to continue uh, honoring her, uh, 
put our prep. The next thing that we do is, uh, well, uh, we have some pictures of Martina. Uh, this is part of the one of the performance of the exhibition that, that we had uh, during that festival. We had artists that created masks and created uh, sculptures about, based on, on the story of Martina, uh, Perez and Martina. And actually, I brought, you can, I brought Martina. This is actually the puppet that we use in the show. It's a Buntraku puppet. You can, you can go ahead. Uh, in the show that we do. Uh, we have been performing the show for 10 years um, uh, and we have visited like how many schools? Like probably like 500 or 600 schools. We have done the performance in many, many different places. And we use puppets and you can go ahead. Yeah, um, puppets, different kinds of puppets. This is our version of uh, Perez and Martina. Keep going. And it's a full production. We have traveled with this show to many places, not only to Puerto Rico, to Venezuela, to many states in, in the United States. And it's a way that we're not only sharing uh, her most famous story, but also um, a, you know, exposing the new generations to this uh, wonderful woman and, and, and her legacy. Let's, let's keep going. The next show that we have, the, the next story that we have rescued, and, and, and it's one of our favorite stories, uh, one of my favorite stories is Juan Bobo. Uh, there's many different versions of, of Juan Bobo, and actually Juan Bobo is a character that you can find in many places in the Caribbean and in many countries in Latin America. However, in Puerto Rico, we say, no, no, Juan Bobo is nuestro. You know, we, we, Juan Bobo is nuestro, so we decided to put together a production based on some of her stories stories and also some of the stories that we collected from the oral traditions in Puerto Rico. Um, and in this case, we decided to combine it with a similar character, but in the Dominican Republic, that is called Pedro Animal. Even though in Puerto Rico we have a Pedro Animala, which is pretty much the same. I mean, it's like, and in the show, you can actually go ahead. In the show, we, we talk about, not only we present, th this is me, but you know, if, you want, if you're wondering, that's me, uh, and performing. We use puppets, we use, we use live music. Music, go ahead. Um, and we, in this show, like I said, you know, we took stories not only from Pura but from the oral traditions of Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic, and we're trying to uh, talk about the, the similarities of our community uh, and and the differences too. So um, the show deals with this this uh, issue that the. The neighbors fighting, they say, no, we just have to do it. No, this show uh, deals with this, showing the kids that, you know, in, in, in uniting the communities will be a stronger uh, community. Um, and, and we do it through the stories of Pura, we do it with the stories uh, of the traditional stories, like the stories of Juan Bobo and Pedro Animal. Keep going. The, uh, the other uh, story that we do from Pura is the Legends of Enchanted Treasure. We use, uh, we do, uh, this is the show that is happening right now in Cesar. So if you want to come see it every Saturday at 3 o'clock, we have performances. Um, it's a show uh, that we do, we have four different legends from indigenous peoples in the Americas, and we decided to take one of her stories, uh, her Taino story called La Leyenda del Zumbador, the, the Legend of the, the, of the Hummingbird. And we do it with shadow puppets and animation. And again, it's a way I brought some of the puppets. Oops, sorry. So these are the folk. Can you help me, Flo? Because in the publicity said that I will have to bring puppets, so I am bringing puppets. Uh, this is it's a beautiful story. I don't know. I don't know if you guys know the story or have read the Legend of the Zumbador. It's a beautiful Taino um, story, and we do it with with shadow puppets and animation and another, you know, and beautiful music that was composed by Puerto Rican composer Manuel Calzada. So in this way, we're trying to basically rescue through theater uh, instead of. Uh, and, and storytelling with puppets, uh, some of her of her work and of her amazing work that she did in many communities, um, and and I know that Marilis is going to talk a little bit about how powerful and how um, uh, such an act of activism and empowerment this this you know going to the to the libraries and going to the communities was. Um, Part of the Pura del Press project as well is that we have been, I have been writing a play uh, about her, um, <clears throat> 
about her, her real life story, uh, this place for adults is called Los Tiempos de Pura Bel Pre. It's, uh, it's a show for three actresses and it's, it's showing Pura in three different stages of her life. And I'm doing this because I feel that people need to know about her amazing story um, and how powerful this woman was. Um, and his stories, the first, the first part of the play is her early years in Puerto Rico, which there's not too much uh, information I've been looking and researching about her early years in Puerto Rico. Then uh, Pura del Pre as a young adult, uh, in, you know, when she recently moved, you know, in the 20s, uh, moved to, to, to New York and all the things that she found in New York. And then uh, Pura del Pre before she passed away. So that's called, it's called Los Tres Tiempos de Pura del Pre. That's a project that is happening. The last thing, and with this, I will close of the of the Pura del Pre project, which is some, one of the things that I that I find out as a, a, as a researcher. Uh, my doctoral dissertation was about the development of educational theater in Puerto Rico and, and the development of puppetry, since you know I love puppets so much. Um, and the earliest data that I could find for many years was that in the late 40s, uh, beginning of the 50s, there were groups uh, of, of Puerto Rican actors and, and puppeteers that, I mean, and basically actors and storytellers that would go to El Morro or go to the, 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 the plazas, the plazas públicas, and they would use puppets as well to tell stories. But then, when I started researching about Pura, and I realized that she started this, you know, way before. My theory is that Pura probably is the first Puerto Rican puppeteer, even though it was in the, the, the diaspora, the first Puerto Rican puppeteer uh, recorded in, in contemporary history that I, I, you know, I've been researching for years, and I would like uh, been talking to to El Centro to continue this research and find out about her training, about the style of puppetry that that, that she used and how she used puppets uh, uh, to. To empower communities and to and and to tell and share her, her stories, and that is something. It's a it's a project that is been going on little by little. I've been doing this research, finding out, um, uh, and it's something that hopefully and it's, uh, we could publish one day. And I, if I ever finish it, Edwin, uh, I, but I I, am, I I will I will make the time for it. So um, this is some of the things that we are doing in Teatro Sea. We wanted to share this with you um, and we'll, we'll let Marilisa talk and then at the, and after that then we'll talk a little bit more about the impact of these uh, pr productions and, and what we're doing in, in the community. Thank you. Um, and my name is Marilisa Jimenez Garcia and I'm a research associate uh, here at Centro in Children's Literature. And usually when I tell people that, I get two reactions. Number one, that is so important. Thank you. And I have people shake my hand, hug me. Um, I've actually um, also had people say, oh, that's so sweet, thank you. You know, and it's just like this sense of importance and endearment. Um, and I really want to think about why we think this is so important. What is it that we seem to think that these books and these stories do? Um, and I just want to start with this, you know, recently in the headlines within uh, the y last year, actually three New York Times articles have talked about what's called the segregation of children's literature. And even recently, um, you had Christopher Dean Myers call, um, call it the apartheid of children's literature. Um, Hillary Clinton held a, a press conference last February, or this February actually, last month, to talk about how Latinos need to read more to their children. And you know, it just seems like something that's so pressing today. And I really want to say, you know, when, when words like apartheid are used, and when a former Secretary of State calls attention to an issue, we need to see that the realm of the child is a highly politicized background within US culture. Yet there is a lack of awareness within the academy and society about the cultural role of children's material and performance culture in the United States in the U.S.-Puerto Rico relationship and in the Puerto Rican diaspora. Okay, so actually, did you know 
that some of the first literature published about Puerto Rico when the U.S. invaded Puerto Rico in 1898 was children's books, okay? There's a history of newspapers, anthropological guides, and children's books. And this is actually one of the books published from the time. It's called Greater America, um, 1899. And it's sort of like a history, like who are these people? Why did we go there? Uh, what are we going to do? Um, explaining that to youth at the time. Um, you know, I think it's interesting to think also that children's writers were some of the first people on the island after um, the encounter. And one of the overwhelming themes of these books during this time is that Puerto Ricans have no history. Okay, sort of like, this is why it was so easy. Um, and Buena Belpre may have encountered some of these books when she went to the New York Public Library. We're always talking about how she saw these shelves and she saw no stories of Puerto Rico. Well, she may have seen some of these, but no stories representing sort of the original folklore of the culture. Um, and the reason that cultures fight for representation on the children's bookshelf is because children's books are a tool in empire building. However, what's interesting about Buddha, which is something we're, we're talking about today, is this idea of performance. So the importance of books and the importance of understanding and to an extent uh, usurping the systems outside the book, precisely because access to the literary establishment is difficult uh, for marginalized groups. Okay, so this role of storyteller is something I want to emphasize too, because there's plenty of children's authors, not all of them are uh, storytellers. Okay, what does it really mean to be a storyteller? And I'm drawing here from a theory by Walter Benjamin. Um, you know, the storyteller is a role outside and inside the literature, outside the book and inside the book. And it really gives us a way of looking at literature as sort of like just a script, okay? We can sort of add to it, but we're not necessarily held to the, um, the what's in the book. Um, Robin Bernstein recently talks about this theory of the archive of repertoires, and I want to think about that in terms of how we see Buddha. And even here at the Central Library, when we pick out, you know, the, I don't know how many of you have gone there, but we take the books and we look at her scripts and all these things. We're really looking at a history of, of repertoires and things that were performed and meant to be performed. So, um, and were meant to be embodied as well. Um, sorry, children actually acted out some of these plays, and they embodied, you know, Perez and Martina. They embodied um, a lot of the characters that she has, like the Taino, the Hibaro. So it wasn't just a matter of telling the story; it was retelling the story, and acting out the story, and going into libraries and going into schools as many times as possible. So she had a way of sort of upholding books, but at the same time saying you know what, books are not enough. We need these other practices. Um, so in terms of her uh, role as a storyteller also, um, one of the things that I wanted to do also is thinking about, okay, so these folk tales were going around and she was telling them all over the place. So what do they mean? What are some things that these stories may be saying? Well, actually, um, you know, something that we learn from children's literature scholar Philip Nell, he actually says, we learn from children's literature the art of subversion. Okay, so indeed, no one expects too much resistance from a sweet little lady telling stories to children, right? So son cosa de niño. Yet, by giving Puerto Rican children a sense of cultural heritage, regardless of problems within the versions of history, Belper was resisting the dominant theme of Puerto Ricans as culturally void. The stories she chose to tell can be read as providing ways in which she can learn, when children can learn modes of resistance which allow them to maneuver within a world in which they would not be in power. This is clear distinction from uh, literature of Anglo children, which they learn to be better members of the ruling classes. Um, so each of these modes of resistance that I'm going to talk about is something she also embodied in terms of the practices of storytelling. Okay, so this is what you do if you live in a land and you're not in power, okay? Folk tales uh, by Buddha Belpre seem to give us these modes of resistance. Number one, you can outsmart uh, the systems around you. Okay, and this is something that we see uh, when Belpre lit the candle the first time in the New York Public Library in the 1920s. Um, she lit the candle without having a book. This is important for us to think about because at the time the New York Public Library had a policy that was if you don't have a published book, you cannot tell a story, okay? So she manages to convince them to tell her stories, light this candle, and 
be able to tell her stories with just a manuscript version of Perez and Martina. So no publication at the time. Um, you know, and this ritual meant that they would light this candle and at the end children would blow out the candle and say a wish, okay? So at the end of the tale, children were invited to wish and blow out the candle. This ritual signified that children, to an extent, made a wish for the future on the notion that they had a past. Belper was able to convince the NYPL and Mary Gold Davis, the head of storytelling, to let her initiate these rituals without books. Belper's lighting of the candle symbolized two important concepts. One, that regardless of legal or political status, the New York Public Library, whether they realized it or not, had recognized Puerto Rico as a separate country within its uh, fairy tale shelves, which at the time they saw as almost like a little mini United Nations. So all the fairy tales were cataloged and they represented that particular nation. So by lighting this candle without a book, it was sort of like saying, well, Puerto Rico is a nation. And number two, that Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans had a past. And if they had a past, they could have a future. Okay, so another way that um, we see this version of outsmart or this tactic of outsmart um, is in the tiger and the rabbit, and I don't know how many of you know that. We, we talk a lot about Perez and Martina. We need to talk about some other stories, okay? Wait, wait, um, wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 no, wait, you're gonna have that later in your, in your other show. Uh, tiger and the rabbit is about, can you believe it? A tiger and the rabbit. Um, <laughs> however, um, this story is a very interesting um, story in the, in the sense of the symbols uh, that it uses. In Latin American folk, or many times, um, powerful characters or oppressive characters are represented by some kind of big cat, okay, a tiger, a lion, big cat, okay? So here you have the tiger who represents an oppressive, powerful figure, um, and it's interesting because he is in the land with those he oppresses, okay? So it's a very sort of close dynamic that we have here between the oppressor and those who are oppressed. They are so together that they're almost friends. It's like they get along. Um, it's almost like, you know, we love each other, but we hate each other. You know, we're just stuck together and we don't know what to do. Um, and the tiger may be big and, and, and uh, powerful, but he happens to be very dumb. Um, and the islander realizes this, and he also has more experience with the land and is able to trick the tiger um, into using his own power to be able to actually ward off some of the other little uh, animals who are also trying to kill the rabbit, okay? So the rabbit sort of makes a difference between, or, or makes a choice between, well, do I go with this guy who's trying to eat me and he's bigger than me, or should I use his power to ward off th those other uh, challenges that are close to me here um, from some of the other animals. So actually at the end, the rabbit rides off on the tiger's back and wards away other uh, evils and we see how um, this idea of using your wit to trick uh, those who are in power is a way of resisting um, oppression. Oops, sorry. So the second mode that we can see um, is the idea of negotiation. So outsmart, negotiate is another way. Um, this is, can also be seen as a kind of civil disobedience. Uh, many times in the folk tales, you'll see that the Taino is sort of the role that you see here in terms of this, this idea of negotiating um, when you're in a, in a place where you're not in power. And the Taino was uh, this idea of this very noble figure. He appeals to humanity and dignity. He's the kind of person, or she's the kind of person, who um, stops and says, you know, you don't want to do this. This is not how we should be leading. We should think about these other things um, in terms of humanity. And you see um, this in a story like uh, the tale of Iahocha. I have a hard time saying that. Let's all learn Taino. Iahocha, okay? Iahocha. Iahocha, he knows how to say it. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Okay, um, and this is a story about a Taino woman who negotiates for the life of her son. Uh, General, um, I'm sorry, Senor Salazar yeah. is a conquistador and he takes okay. her son uh, captive yeah, and she's yeah, okay. able to plead with him uh, by saying, Senor Salazar, you know, I know you must have a mother because of her. You can understand my suffering. My son is young and loves his liberty. He should live to enjoy it. So she's able to get um, Senor Salazar to release the son. However, Salazar, even though he praises um, Ivia Hocha uh, and her nobility, he still doesn't necessarily deter from the war um, on the Tainos. Um, and so we learn this idea of 
negotiation. From the Taino, we also get um, a sense of what I see as uh, the third mode, which is preserve or persevere. Okay, um, the stories that uh, had to be preserved for for Belpre were those that would be for the Puerto Rican child, what she calls the Puerto Rican child in this new land, and it, it was all about passing this on. So this practice of storytelling and puppetry, and uh, you know, performing it, acting it out, putting on the costumes, it was all about passing on uh, these stories. And we see that she does this with and without books at times. Okay, um, this was a deeply nationalist project, a nation-building project. Um, she talks about how. Um, she believed that the folklore would uh, connect the child in this land with the collective psychology, what she called the collective psychology of the child on the island. So a way of uniting um, those two children that she saw in terms of uh, Puerto Rican sort of cultural nationhood. Another thing that's interesting about the Taino, which at first when I thought about it, I'm like, that seems kind of passive, but it's really kind of an interesting way of um, resisting. The Taino often is um, pictured in the folk tales as sort of like this enduring presence that's still in the land, okay? So the rocks that are there in Puerto Rico today, those are uh, Tainos that were turned into rocks by a witch. Or, um, for, for example, I have a picture here of the legend of the, I think the royal palm, and this is Milamaki, and Milamaki was running from a conquistador, and he didn't know what to do, so he turned himself into a tree. And that tree is still there to this day. And she would emphasize that in the stories. It's like, if you go there today, you'll still see this tree. You'll still see those rocks. Um, and the stone dog is about a story, um, it's a story where um, a dog who is so faithful just waits for his master, and he turns into a, a, a rock, and that rock is still day, is still there to this day. And actually, in uh, once in Puerto Rico, in the beginning, Belper emphasizes in, in the introduction that she was in Puerto Rico one day, and she still saw that stone dog. It is still there to this day. Okay, this idea of um, silent resistance. So you know, these markers are still there. We just have to know what they mean. If we have that cultural typology, we'll know what it means. Mm -hmm. um, so this persistent resistance uh, that demands justice is, is also um, in the in the Taino. And this is the last thing I want to talk about, and it's this idea again about persevere, preserve. Um, and you know, she wanted to be remembered as a Puerto Rican Johnny Appleseed. And I remember the first time I heard that, I thought that was so strange. I'm like, really, Johnny Appleseed? You know, that's such an American symbol, right? Because what, what did Johnny Appleseed do? That's a question for you guys. What did Johnny Appleseed do? Come on, you know. All right, all right, so you knew that. Johnny Appleseed planted uh, apple trees all over the United States, and the legend has it, if we look today, right, those trees are still there to this day, even if we don't really know that Johnny Appleseed, but, you know, maybe he didn't have eaten. Um, if you think about it, um, this definition of diaspora is actually, what is it? Scattering seed. That's what a diaspora is, is. So if you think about her, sort of this idea that she's telling us that she scattered these seeds and these stories, and that legacy could still be here to this day, okay, if we look around. Um, something I want to think about a little bit is the problems maybe with Belper's folklore, um, even though I love her and she's my icon and everything, but we need to think about, you know, this idea, and this goes back to the, to the headlines today, how can children see themselves in, in, in literature? How can they see themselves um, in theater? And, you know, we need to be very careful with that because there may be children that don't identify with Teresa Martina today. Um, and that's why I think it's so interesting that what Manuel is doing is sort of making it more relevant to um, maybe the, the landscape that they identify with today, which may not be the island, right? Um, and this also, this idea of subjective, you know, m she didn't really show uh, stories about children in the urban center um, or many protagonists. There's not very many protagonists uh, that Belper wrote about that were actually children. Um, they're mostly animal fables or these characters from the past. Um, so thinking about how we can have new cultures of the diaspora around the United States. Um, so this idea of 
it's still there to this day. And I would say that Pura Balbre is a really kind of definitely someone who outsmarted uh, a lot of what's understood as a literary legacy because today we still don't have her books in print. And they haven't been in print for at least a good 40 years. Yet she is the namesake of a children's literature medal. Okay, um, And I just think it's, it's something interesting to think about how she used books, how she didn't use books, and that her legacy is still here to this day. Thank you. It was the eve of January 5th. Oh, the eve of the Three Kings Day, the day where all the Spanish children eagerly await for their guests. And in the sumptuous palace in the Orient, where the Three Kings Magi lived, it rained excitement and confusion. Throughout the walls, you can hear Lord Chamberlain's voice giving orders to the hundreds of servants there. But it wasn't all happy. In the stable, the horses were outraged. They were stomping. A name. It was so loud that Lord Chamberlain asked for Carlos, one of the stable boys, to see what was happening there. Hey, why are you making so much noise? Shh. This is not fair. This is not fair. Why? Why are the camels the only ones that are allowed to take the kings into their trip? We want to go. We want to go. No, listen. You can't go. It's always been like this. For years and years. I'm sorry. Be quiet. Oh. The horses will fill with jealousy. Envy. Well, that afternoon the kings hopped on their camels and went on their trip. Team <laughs> Melchor, Gaspar, and Baltasar were really happy. Suddenly, night fell. It's a very dark and somber night indeed. Don't worry. That King Gaspar. Soon the star will come. And as he was talking, the star came into the sky. King Baltasar said, Hmm, it's a little early for that star. Well, maybe I lost track of time. <laughs> and they follow the star. <laughs> well, my friends, the star took him all the way into their palace. Hey, how are we back into the palace? That cannot be. Oh no, we travel in circles. But we follow the star. We follow the star. That was not a star. Oh, who said that? Who said that? <clears throat> it's me. A little beetle came from behind a camel's ear. See, I've been meaning to tell you all this time that horses did a trick on you. What do you mean? Well, the horses were so filled with jealousy and envy that that afternoon they called on the fireflies. Firefly! Lucia Raga! Firefly! Firefly, we need your help. You shine just like a star. Maybe you can trick the kings and he will follow a bunch of you and think, think it's a star and then sure. they will blame it on the camels and then we will be able to go on the trip. Oh, that sounds so mean and evil. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Ale 
Pedro, tú Pérez, how are you? Kings, Kings, I finally was able to catch him. I've been trying to tell you, but I heard, I overheard the horse's plan, but it was too late. You were already gone. But everything is safe. Now don't worry. Rato Pérez saved the day. What do you mean? Well, last night I went and I wanted to talk with Father Time. But Father Time was not there. So I went and I changed the clock back 24 hours. So now you will have ample time to deliver the gifts to the kids. Rato Pérez, you are the best! Thank you so much. You're welcome. Na, 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 Rato Pérez is our hero. Well, the kings hop back onto the camels. And when night fell, they saw the brightest star they could ever see. That's it. That is the star. That is the star that we saw centuries ago into our way to Bethlehem. That's our star. They followed that star into the city and they heard the bells. The next morning, all the children woke up and found underneath each bed, inside each shoe, a gift from the three magi, unaware of all the hardships they went through while keeping their faith and their tradition. Y colorín colorado, este cuento se ha acabado. Gracias. So uh, now we have time to answer questions for Marisa or myself. Uh, so if people have questions uh, regarding what all the things that we've been talking about here, so the time. I se me olvidó señales de Juan Bobo. I'm gonna have to bring Juan Bobo out too. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, Pudi's gonna say goodbye. Pudi's gonna say goodbye. Okay. This is one bowl. one bowl. This is one nah. bowl when you saw pictures of it. Ahí está. Okay. Yes. No. Yeah, yeah, she, she was here. Okay. <laughs> okay. In terms of graduate and undergraduate courses in early childhood education, like for example, here at NYU, Columbia, and at Bank Street College, where you have, there, there are concentrations in bilingual early childhood education. Do do we integrate? Yes. Um, you actually train their professors for. I would love to. <laughs> Um, do you do you work with any of the colleges, Manuel, no, or actually, universities? We, no, we don't. Very seldom we do presentations in in colleges and universities, but um, bringing a theater performance, but not really doing like a staff development or, or workshops for them or anything like that. No, it would be a wonderful thing to do. Yeah. Um, I could actually speak to that a little bit. Um, there are perhaps not as many um, graduate you know, in undergraduate courses in children's literature, you know, um, or children's theater, and this is something that's still developing, and definitely in like Latino, bilingual, sort of, uh, that need, that's something that needs to be developed in terms of curriculum, definitely, um, for teacher training. Um, so that that's that's a very important issue. But we in SEA, all these shows they come with a teacher resource guide. They you know with activities and um, and information about Pura, about her stories, about Puerto Rico, and activities so they can continue expanding. But that that's when we go to schools and usually our uh, elementary and, and junior high schools, and we are actually putting together uh, with El Centro some of the materials. That that we're going to be bringing to the libraries and to the parents and so they can continue uh, expanding on the experience that the kids have when we perform. It certainly has implications for the guidance counselors and social workers and Amazon psychologists who are working with pre-K and two. That's right. Absolutely. So. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, well, I'm actually um, nervous and excited, but I do have two questions. I'm a retired teacher. I'm a retired teacher and 
with my class up in Washington Heights, we did a lot of artist studies and we included what I've impressed. So I have a collection, most of the books, and a vinyl record, Spanish on one side and English on the other. Wow. But my question is, um, what was her politics, if you know about that in, her, in your research, and if she had any children of her own? Okay, um, I don't think that, I, there's no record of her having children. Um, in terms of her politics, um, she did write an essay about, I think it's the question of statehood, um, where it implies that she was a supporter of independence. Um, but that's not necessarily something she spoke out a lot about, but that uh, essay is actually available in uh, the Belpre book uh, by Centro on the back, so you can actually read it uh, for yourself. There were other questions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hi, I just want to thank you for your research and your passion. Um, about 20 years ago, as a, I'm not a teacher, but I'm an educator, and about 20 years ago, I was staring at 25 young children, about five to seven years old, at a summer program. It was like 92 degrees, and they were looking at me, and I was looking at them. <laughs> I said, I needed help. And I ran to the library, and that's, you know, I found the book on um, the tiger and the rabbit, oh, and that saved me. That that book saved me. All right. know, and the young people were so happy with me afterwards. I, I think I got the summer off to a really good start <laughs> with that book. Thank God. Um, I have two questions. One is, are there any um, original puppets that have been recovered from her collection? And three, and two is sort of along the lines, you know, I, I'm thinking of the 1920s and 30s, and there's, you know, Arturo Schomburg and a, sort of a, a black consciousness, and I think of her as um, in, in the tradition of the African griot, of transmitting culture and the history, and and w was she sort of conscious of that? It, it, is she aware of her role, and, and aware of her role first as a storyteller, but then also, of course, a, within the African diaspora context of it? Well, just to answer the first question, the puppets, yeah, they, they exist, and, uh, and they're here, actually. Mm -hmm. um, well, in the, in the library, <laughs> so, you know, uh, I think. not here. Uh, I was able to, to see some of them, and in the documentary that Centro is selling as well, in that Centro Produce, I, I was uh, asked to, to look at them and, and to make a comment about the puppets. They usually, they, you know, they're not in great um, state, but they, you know, you can still see um, the, the the work she did because apparently she was the one who built the puppets as well uh, and who saw the, the, the costumes and everything. Um, they were smaller than than the puppets. Can you show? They're, they're smaller than uh, than these puppets that we uh, recreated. Um, uh, and she used instead of paper mache, she used some uh, some material like cast for the for the heads of the puppets. Um, we use per perfect much here because it's lighter, and um, and I do remember like two years ago um, or three years ago, and Museo del Barrio also had an exhibition, and they had two of I think it was Martina with her widow, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, costume. So um, the puppets do exist, and uh, it will be one of my ideas is eventually you know to 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 try to um, reproduce all of them the way. That, that she did it. The ones that we that floor use in, in the performance here, there's basically our own interpretation, a uh, modern interpretation of, of, the, of her characters. Uh, and they were all these puppets and the ones that I show you in the pictures, that they are made by Jose Lopez, who's her puppet master. He lives in Bayamón, Puerto Rico. All our puppets are done in Puerto Rico, actually. We have a studio there. Um, uh, and Jose is a wonderful uh, puppeteer uh, and and he's also very interested in recreating things from from uh, from the past, uh, especially Pura's puppets. You can answer the second. Right. Um, I, I don't know if I remember the whole question, uh, but I think you spoke about the sort of Afro-Caribbean consciousness, right? <laughs> um, this, this idea of oral, oral storytelling. Um, I. You know, I think uh, Victoria Nunez wrote a great article about uh, Belpre and sort of the contrast between Belpre and Schomburg. And, you know, we know that, that she worked at the New York Public Library at the same time, at the 135th Street, which is today the Schomburg Center for Black Culture. Um, and, you know, Belpre and Schomburg are really interesting figures because, as we know, they both have 
um, you know, uh, Afro Boricua uh, heritage. Um, what's interesting too, um, I wrote an article that's coming out in the Central Journal where I talk about the, you know, Belbre and Schomburg, uh, Schomburg being really interested also in gathering artifacts um, and creating an archive to show that there is this heritage, this rich heritage of African, um, you know, heritage. Uh, whereas Belbre decides to, you know, create an archive of sorts, but through this sort of archive of repertoires, which is something I, I spoke about today. So you see the, these similarities in terms of trying to refute this idea of there's no culture, you, you know, and that, that sense of demeaning um, these cultures. And um, I think that, you know, someone like Victoria Nunez's article, um, and then, a, you know, the article that I wrote out, will talk about that. In terms of her consciousness, I think Afro-Caribbean Boricua is something that we are talking about more now than maybe people were at the time. Um, but she's certainly in her folk tales, she represents African heritage, uh, which is you know interesting for her to do, and also Taino heritage. So she has these alternate uh, stories in there, along with the Spanish folklore. Yeah, I will add that she also uses European uh, expressions, and you know, like the whole thing about the peseta, Alice and Martina, the peseta, the song. She, she refers to the king and the and the queen of Spain. I mean, so I think she was pretty inclusive uh, of the three. You know, traditional traditionally we're like. Uh, that's how we, we have been taught that we are, you know, a combination of these three cultures I in Puerto Rico. So I think she was pretty inclusive in her stories, uh, trying to represent or to take from the three: uh, the European, the Taino, indigenous, and the African um, uh, culture. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah, I was just going to ask um, because Marilisa, you mentioned. Um, how relevant are her figures today? Mm -hmm. So I was going to ask you. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, just to repeat what I was saying, um, Marisa mentioned how relevant um, her figures are today. So I was going to ask someone who performs, um, how receptive are the children nowadays to um, performances of her work? Very receptive. I mean, I am. Um, I come from Peru, where I used to do storytelling there with the Ministry of Education and other companies and storytelling shows. I never heard of Pura del Pre. When I came here, I got booked into doing a show about her, and then this project came also along. And so I feel like uh, it's, it's, uh, all the connections with Pura and me, it's just fantastic. I love it. I feel very honored. Um, but when I go to libraries, uh, the children, the art of storytelling is so old, so the children, even if I don't have props, even if I don't have props, because sometimes I do that, just myself and the voices, they find it very receptive. This work particularly and the stories, I think they, they get very connected because they're stories that either maybe they've heard, because I see them, I think I heard when I was a little girl, and the, the animals and all the stuff, they, they do identify with it. I, I believe when they get married, they all go, ew! <laughs> Which is so cute, but but they understand that they understand uh, the proposal, uh, the moment, the love, and and we were very scared of doing the burn mouths about oh, yeah. it because it, because it was scary for us. We were like, should we put it? Should we not? And then Manuel decided that yes, we should because that's the way the story was was made, and it teaches the kids something. I mean, it teaches that not all stories have a, a, a happy ending, but you have to take on it, and that's part of life, and all those things. We don't touch on it, but the children get it, and we finish the story in a happy ending, like orange corazón. They want to say, "Oh, they never ask about it. They they take it, they understand it, and and I think that's." That's the message of it, and, and they're very receptive with it. They never, they, they have never been like, oh no, they've never been crying or anything because I think that they're used to that in cartoons and stuff like that, I think. Yeah. Um, that, that's, that's why it's very receptive. Very good. Any other questions? Comments? That's right. Here. I just want to thank you for continuing this tradition. This is something that is so much in need right now. I've been working for the New York Public Library since 1979, and I met Pura after she had retired. And um, she really, she moved me to become a librarian. And so I'm really proud to see that 
that this is continuing, that her legacy is continuing. And um, as we retire, um, I hope that as retirees, that we can fund and support and even participate in making sure that this continues for not just Puerto Rican children, but for all children, no matter where they're from, because I think all children from all over the world can relate to these stories of and are hungry for these stories. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. There's one. There's, there's one here. Evelyn, uh, Evelyn. over here. Okay. How you doing? Thank you very much for the song. Not <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for the presentation. <laughs> I very much appreciate it. Okay. I was just wondering if you could uh, elaborate a little more on one bowl being, you know, nuestro. Mm. Um, okay. He belongs uh, to us. He belongs to us. Now, um, I, Juan Bobo, the majority of the books that I find, that I find, that there, there's actually like seven to ten books that I have, that I found in Puerto Rico and here, uh, Juan Bobo have always been published as a Puerto Rican character. Um, there are many different Juan Bobos. I mean, there's a lot of tradi uh, theories that the Bobos comes from, you know, India. And then, you know, there's like, like different, um, the whole idea of the bow one is actually in our in our in our uh, teacher resource guide. We talk about the background of this character and how we can find this uh, character all over Latin America, especially in the Caribbean. But um, I really think that the whole idea of of, of uh, Juan Bobo being uh, simple and and innocent is also, uh, but at the same time, smart mm -hmm. without knowing that he's that smart. Because if you mm -hmm. see the majority of the story, that you know he he thinks he's doing something uh, right, and at the end of the day, maybe might, it was wrong, but it it, can, it, it comes out right. That uh, and and it's basically kind of like a homage to the to El Hibaro, El Hibaro Puerto Rican, who was you know pretty smart, but he was simple, uh, hard worker, and he, he had. So he's its own, you know, his own ways to do, to to get things done, and and uh, so I think that you know the figure of Juan Bobo identifies a lot with the other Puerto Rican, and that's why we have embraced it, and we have um, we, we laugh at, at the at the wit or the silly wit of, of Juan Bobo. Um, so I I I know that in Dominican Republic, while I was doing my research, Juan Bobo is also pretty famous, um, but it's never by himself is always with Pedro Animal yeah. you know they're, all, they're brothers actually <laughs> and uh, and it's kind of different because Pedro Animal and, and Juan Bobo uh, in some of the shit of the of the stories and in some of the, the jokes there's a lot of jokes of Juan Bobo and Pedro Animal and they're, they're thieves and they they're, they're tr they're, they are tricksters actually um, so it's, it's, a, it's very different you know how how, how we see the character of Juan Bobo uh, in in Puerto Rico and, and, and in, in Dominican Republic, um, but there's still fun characters that represent an era and a time, uh, and you know, we talk about the, these oral traditions and these stories that come from like many, many, many years ago, and and they still resonate, and the kids enjoy them, and the kids understand, you know, the morals of the stories, and the kids uh, relate to this uh, and to the characters. So yeah, we say that we have claimed him, and I think he belongs to us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I just wanted to let people know if anyone wants to see the books, the original books, that the Bronx Library Center, the Heritage oh. Center, the, the room of the collection, there are the, the books there. Mm -hmm. We do have uh, copies mm -hmm. of Monte, that is in Latina, in English and in Spanish. So if you are interested in bringing your children or students, you can come and see and hold the books and read the books there on the fourth floor of the Bronx Library Center. And you're all welcome to come. 
and, and I know there has been some issues about you know uh, rights and things mm -hmm. like that. For uh, that's why some of the books yeah. cannot have, have not been able uh, to be republished. Uh, we in Teatro Sea, knowing that you know that, that there's a, a situation, we have created our own, our own versions of our, uh, some of our stories, and we have actually a collection of 13 books, bilingual books, with our shows that I were uh, hoping to publish by next year, um, including uh, La Cucarachita Martina, Juan Bobo, but it's not really our own version, but that we're trying to, uh, you know, follow her, her her tradition. I know that Centro has been looking to publish, and uh, you can probably talk a little bit about that, or no? Uh, maybe a little bit. Yes, go We ahead. had a conversation the other day about that, um, that, you know, I think this is something to think about, because it's these, these books are out of print, right? We can go to the libraries and get them, but, take them out. you know, I think what's interesting about Belpre is this idea that, you know, she's on the na on the medal for best children's literature, but we can't get her books, you know. Um, and at the same time, she also has this heritage outside of books, which we can see continues, but I think that also speaks to the fact that um, what we're talking about here is more than just books, right? This idea that um, it takes someone to write a book, it takes someone else to, to think about it, to teach it, it takes someone else to uh, act it out, and that perhaps dramatic play and these sorts of things or storytelling are not necessarily things that we emphasize when we think about problems like what are we going to do if we're not representing minorities in you know children's literature I like to use the word children's culture because I think it is more inclusive of really what children are reading and um, looking at in terms of materials but um, I think there's something to be said here about uh, bringing these books uh, back into print although I know it's a complicated issue but uh, perhaps there's something that can be done about it just to clarify, some of the uh, original work that we have uh, had on Polish, we publish in the Lisa. That's right. The Lisa, um, the Lisa uh, book uh, mm -hmm. that is presented here. Right. And, uh, and also, we, we reproduce some of her short stories in the book. Yes. So even though the other ones are free, we got permission to reproduce some of them. Right. And, you know, Central also has a copy of all the, all, all the books. But yeah. we're referring maybe as, as children's books with illustrations yeah. and all that. Having said that, the, what's well, true for Juan Bobo is also true for, uh, for Tarachita. It's a, you know, it's a folklore story. There are many versions from Spain throughout Latin America. Yes. The same story. Yes. This is her version. Mm -hmm. But there is nothing that says that whatever you reproduce through your theater is as valid a story as what she did. So even though we may not have in print all her original publications, mm -hmm. we do have reprints of some of the work in our book yeah. plus. Your version of Cucarachita is as bad as her. That's right. And I think it's better because her ending is a little bit dark for my taste. And I think your ending is a bit more uplifting. <laughs> We we actually have two different versions, and in, in the main stage production, yes, in the main in the main production, they you know we change the story. The storyteller says, well, even though the the, the original story says that Martina Widow, in our story, her you know her love. They flourish and they live happily ever after. We changed that a little bit, but not in this version. We wanted to be uh, fair to what she wrote. Uh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Any other comments or questions? Back here. Yes. Uh, have you ever experimented with taking the uh, pairing of uh, elementary or early child school? With a senior center, yes. uh, whereby it could, you can have a very good intergenerational arrangement, which was definitely very positive for both generations at the opposite end of the life. We line. we do many performances like that. We call it. We have a series. It's called Teatro para los Abuelitos for grandparents. Actually, our brochure is out there. Oh, uh, great. Yeah, and we combine performances with senior centers and children, and they are the most amazing experiences because we always have a Q and A at the end, and you know, the kids participate, uh, they answer questions to the to the seniors or vice versa. We also, during the weekends, because Teatro Sea, every Saturday at 3 o'clock, we have performances for general audiences. And, and and of course, Cucarachita Martin is part of the repertory and Juan Bobo and all the stories. We always, um, sometimes when I'm not performing, I'm doing box office because we wear many hats. And then all of a sudden, I see these 
seniors coming to the to the theater and uh, I say how many you always ask how many kids how many adults because uh, there's two different prices and and he said no just two adults and I'm like oh okay um, you know I said yeah we grew up uh, with La Cucarachita Martina we come and they cry when they perform they're, they're really uh, están recordando los viejos tiempos you know stay, you know so we have that happening almost every 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 month in oh, Seattle. Great for Alzheimer's patients with a long-term memory. Perfect. And, you know, we are there. We're in the Lower South. We have a brand new theater, beautiful space. <laughs> uh, for the past three years, we've been there. And, you know, we have this season. Uh, and we do close to 200 performances a year um, during the weeks. We are in schools or doing performances for senior centers. Centers, or they come to our theater. And during the weekends, every Saturday, we have performances. So you should come and check us out. Yes. Be nice and loud. Nice and loud. So, uh, the 30 minutes, you, uh, you were talking about the process of her sitting down and, and uh, counting the stories. Uh -huh. uh, can you talk about, first of all, the uh, sort of ritualistic nature of the lighting of the candle? Uh, can you maybe explain, explain why that you further? That? Yeah. And then also, um, okay. how was it that, you know, was it that the New York Public Library just let her continue telling these stories despite the sort of kind of nature. Um, did they ever ask questions about that? Um, okay. The the candle lighting is something that the New York Public Library used to do. It was part of their storytelling ritual. So it's not something that she generated. It's mm -hmm. it's actually something that they did. And so when we see it here today, it's really like a recreation of that. Um, the first time that she told stories, uh, it, it, uh, Puerto Rican folklore, you know, at the New York Public Library, she did not have a published book. She had a manuscript of Perez and Martina. And we know that she was the first one to write in English uh, Puerto Rican folklore. So um, that was the first time. But after that, you know, once she had uh, her books, uh, she would uh, tell them, you know, the same way that all the other storytellers would tell them. It was really just this first time that, that she did it. But I, I think there's value in, um, in the fact that she did this without a published uh, work with manuscripts. So it's something that they sort of like, you know, let her do. Um, but I, I don't think that, that necessarily saw it as um, subversive, but um, I mean, I, I, I'm obviously reading more into more the symbolism of a candle being lit and the fact that they were recognizing it as part of a heritage of national folklore, um, which, which is what the folk tales and the folk fairy tales at the time represented um, on the bookshelves at the New York Public Library. I don't, I don't know if you had another question after that. Right here. Again. Hello there. <laughs> I was just wondering uh, what kind of conversations, if any, have you had with uh, Lisa Sancho Gonzalez, the author of yeah. the Stories I Read to the Children? Mm -hmm. um, I have, when I was a graduate student, I wrote to Lisa Sanchez Gonzalez because I am indebted to her. I mean, I think a lot of us who do Puerto Rican literature, period, are indebted to uh, Boricua literature, which is. If the, it's the first, but it's I, you know one of the best studies of Puerto Rican literature that I've ever seen. Um, so I wrote to her, um, and I also have received messages uh, from her. Um, I actually reviewed the stories I read uh, for the children for um, Latino Studies Journal. Um, so and she cites um, one of my articles in, in the book. So you know it's. It, it, I'm able here, and I think a lot of us here are able today to just talk about Belpre because of these people like Lisa Sanchez Gonzalez who paved the way, um, you know, Julio Hernandez Delgado, Vic Victoria Nunez. Um, but I think Belpre scholarship really has a lot of room still uh, to grow. But um, but yeah, I've never actually met her though. <laughs> I have. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, and, and she's fantastic, and I would urge everybody to buy that book. It's fantastic. Uh, Absolutely. It's really great. It gives you a, a historical background of her of her life um, and then you you read the the stories that we probably know but we also you can read stories that were not published uh, until now and then also a uh, wonderful essays that she wrote about you know bilingual education storytelling you know it's it's really an amazing amazing book and and I congratulate uh, the center for publishing that amazing uh, book so I think they're selling it and also the documentary is very good as well 
well. Um, it's, it's really a wonderful documentary, so if you're interested in learning uh, and going in depth uh, uh, with, you know, Buddha's work, you know, those two, um, uh, those two are great, great, great resources for, for your research and to learn more about her work. Any other comment, question? Yes. I have a question. Yes. Buddha as a librarian. Mm -hmm. um, not a storyteller. Okay. I'm really interested in the work that you did to actually curate the Spanish language collection of books as objects for the children to look at if you could talk a little about that. Um, I mean, we know, you know, in terms of the work that she did uh, for uh, Spanish, you know, librarianship, I mean, it's really, you know, one, a pioneer there for sure, especially with the New York Public Library. She wrote, I think, the first bibliography um, of uh, Spanish language materials, um, which I think there's actually a copy of that at the Central Archives. Um, and I think some people are actually still using that um, within uh, librarianship. So. Um, um, you know, I, I have to say I don't maybe emphasize her as much as maybe other scholars perhaps should. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but, um, you know, definitely also we have a lot of translations by Pura Belpre. She translated a lot of children's right. books. Um, and if you look at those, those are also an interesting way of looking at her storytelling because uh, there's one that's uh, Little Bear uh, by Maurice Sendak, which is a real like children's classic, uh, you know, traditional children's classic, and she writes Osito, mm -hmm. you know, and it's the same illustrations by Maurice Sandek, but it's Buddha Belpre's version um, or translation of it. So there's lots of areas here to think about in terms of um, further scholarship that needs to be done. No more comments? Okay. You want more? You want more? Oh, <laughs> Another story. Another candle? Yes. Let's just make a wish. We have to make a wish on our past that we have a future. Closing our eyes and making a wish. Ready? You have your wish? Yeah. Let's have it. All right, hold on. Electronic <laughs> candle. I'm having a little trouble here. Ready? One, two. Very good. <laughs> everybody for being here tonight, especially our three wonderful guests, Drs. Manuel Moran and Marilisa Jimenez okay. Garcia and Flor Bromley. Very beautiful. This has been a very inspiring, informative, and very theatrical evening. I'm, I'm sure you all enjoyed it. And as, it, as it's been mentioned throughout the evening, we do have books on sale. Uh, of Pura Belpre, we also have uh, Helena Valentin, we have calendars that talk about our events in the next coming season, the next coming months, as well as a beautiful display of the Pura Belpre posters in the back that they're beautiful, their illustrations are just lovely, so please take a moment to look at them. It was a labor of love uh, that this was done with, and enjoy, and thank you again for coming. Felicidades. Felicidades, Igualmente. Ay, yo sé, sí, 